All right, um, so we're back. Let's continue with, uh, with some more details on partial derivatives here. Um, so one of the things that you can do, and let's continue with this first example, is, is you can also look at second order. And I'm not going to do all of them, but let me, let me do a couple of them. So we could do something like this. We could do, you know, so fxx of x, y, z. Uh, this is also denoted this way, d squared f dx squared. And, and this means you, you take the partial derivative of the partial derivative. So we've already done the first partial derivative. So we can plug that in. And now we do one more derivative. So we get to 12x squared y squared z cubed, right? Um, one of the things that you might notice, you've probably noticed if you've been working on some exercises with partial derivatives, and, and certainly if you've read the book, let's say, is um, I could do this partial derivative, so fxy. Now the notation, sometimes it gets confusing with the notation, which one goes first. And, the, the basic rule of thumb is always that whichever one is closest to the function is the first partial derivative to be executed, right? And, and it's the same sort of story if you're, if you're in this notation. Um, here it would be dy dx, right? The x is closest, it goes first, then you do the y derivative. So this means the, the derivative with respect to y of the x derivative And that gives you 8x cubed y z cubed. Okay. Uh, uh, on the other hand, you could do you could do this one. You could do f y x of x y z. And so this means that the y is closest. You're doing y first and then x. In this sort of Leibniz notation, it looks like this. Um, you're doing y and then x, okay? Um, so this means you're, you're going to first do the y derivative, and then you're gonna take the derivative of that with respect to x, and that's gonna give you 8x cubed y z cubed, right? And one of the things you probably notice is that those two answers are the same, and this is not a coincidence. Uh, there's a theorem, and I'll, I'll write this down in a minute, which tells you that the order doesn't matter under certain conditions. And this theorem is, is named after Clairaut, who is a, a French mathematician. Um, so it turns out that actually the only thing that matters for a, for a suitably well-behaved function is, is how many derivatives you're doing for each of the variables, right? Because you can go to third, fourth, you know, higher, to higher order partial derivatives. And, you know, so if you did like x, x, y, x, y, x, you know, y, x, x, these are all the same, right? Two x's and a y, doesn't matter what order they come in, you'll always get the same answer. Um, here's some, some related terminology which can be useful. Okay, so a function f is, um, so it will be called c0 if it's continuous, um, c1 if the, uh, if your first order partials Are continuous um, C2. If the second partials are continuous uh, and so on. So you can do you can do C3, C4, C5, right? So so the number tells you, you know, up to what order do you expect to have 
um, continuous partial derivatives. Uh, in fact, you can, you know, you can you can also consider some special ones. Are um, so you could do c infinity, uh, which just means that all partial derivatives of all orders exist and they're continuous. Um, this is sometimes also called smooth. Right. Um, this is kind of a you know a really strong implementation of the word smooth. Uh, there, there's also, uh, and, and this, you don't need to know this, but I thought I'd mention it. There's also something called C omega, which stands for analytic, okay? Um, so, so C omega means that the function is equal um, to its Taylor series expansion. Um, you probably saw in Calc 3 uh, some examples of you know, a, a function which is smooth but does not equal its Taylor series expansion. There are, there are a few examples of this. They're very, they're, you know, they're not that common, but they're out there. Uh, so analytic is, is, a, is a stronger condition than smooth, as it turns out. Um, so, so in general, you know, um, C2 implies C1 implies, implies C0, right? So there's, you know, as you go up, as, you know, in, in higher order partial derivatives, the, the higher orders you have, they automatically imply all the lower orders as long as your partials are continuous. Um, there is sort of an intermediate step here. Um, C1, having continuous first order partials, um, implies that your function is differentiable. And if you know that your function is differentiable, that implies that it's continuous. Um, so, so it turns out, and I don't think we will find any kind of, I, I don't know if we have time, maybe I'll put this on an assignment. Um, but with a little bit of work, you can cook up some counterexamples. You can find examples of functions uh, which are differentiable, but not C1. Um, so C1 is also sometimes called continuously differentiable, right? Um, and, and so generally we work with this C1 condition because it's usually a lot easier to check. Uh, in a later video, I'll define what it means to be differentiable. You'll see why uh, C1 is, is much more convenient. And, and it, it's hard to find examples of differentiable functions which are not C1. Uh, they certainly won't come up for the sorts of functions that we look at. Um, so this is one theorem that, that is, uh, you know, it's, it's an important theorem and it's actually a fairly difficult theorem. We're not going to try to prove it. Uh, the fact that a C1 function is differentiable. Um, proving that differentiable functions are continuous is not much worse than it is in one variable. Um, but this, uh, th this fact here that simply having continuous first order partial derivatives, um, knowing that that's enough for your function to be differentiable, that's actually a very difficult result to prove. Right? Um, so existence of partials is not enough. Continuity gives you, gives you what you need. Um, the, other, the other property I mentioned before we close here is that uh, Clairaut's theorem says that if your function is C2, then that implies that the, uh, all of the mixed partials, so the second order mixed partial derivatives are, are equal. So that's the theorem due to, uh, due to Clairaut. Okay? Um, and, and you can extend that, right? So if your function was, say, C5, then all of the fifth order partial derivatives, mixed partial derivatives are, are equal as long as, you know, you have the same number of each variable appearing, you can, you can extend it. But the, the important one is that your, your second order mixed partial derivatives are, in fact, um, equal. Uh, and that'll, that'll come up a few times in the course, the fact that those partials are equal. Um, for now, you can think of it as, as kind of a computational convenience because it means that, you know, if you know one of these, you immediately know the other one. You don't have to worry about computing both. Okay, uh, we'll stop here.